Welcome back to Undergraduate Seminar, everyone. I'm delighted to have Eric Tu from University of Washington Tacoma, who's going to tell us about making juggling mathematical. Eric, take it away. All right, very good. First of all, thank you for the invitation to speak. Also, thank you for everyone attending, whether you're over there on campus in the room or online. Uh, so as you might guess from the title of the talk, there's going to be some work required to make juggling into a mathematical idea. So there's the practice of juggling, which has existed for a long time. And what I'll do at the mostly for the first half of the talk is establish some precise definitions and give some good examples so we understand how we can talk about it using mathematical language. Um, so I've already sort of said this, but uh, juggling is old. Uh, just one historical thumbnail sketch here is that the oldest depictions of juggling are in an Egyptian temple at Beni Hassan, dating from um, a date that's older than we usually run across. So 1994 to 1781 BCE is the date uh, estimated. And you can see the jugglers here, each having uh, different numbers of balls. Looks like most of them have three, but you know, there's performance and entertainment that's part of it. So you would imagine that if juggling is this old, that there uh, have been ways to describe different juggling patterns that people can throw and that those have been made precise. Surprisingly, it was only in the 1980s that we really developed a mathematical system for these. So, you know, most for most of history, it's been entertainment, it's been artistry, and starting in the 1980s, jugglers developed a way to keep track of these different patterns mathematically, and this is where we get the idea of a sight swap. Now, I'll take a couple slides here to, to define a sight swap, but if you're familiar with juggling, you probably use that word. Uh, the basic idea is to encode the throws that you're making numerically. So what is the numerical code? Well. Um, usually when I introduce the topic, most people are thinking of it in terms of physics. So we know that when we throw a ball, it makes a parabolic arc. Um, and you sort of think, oh, the higher I throw it, the longer it's going to be in the air. And that's definitely part of the juggling practice. But in terms of making it mathematical, think of it more like uh, sheet music. So you've got a, a rhythm, you've got a sequence of beats that are keeping time. And so really what you want to know is when are the ball is going to hit my hand when I'm juggling. And if you're juggling at the same pace, then you can think of those beats a lot like measures in music. So the height of a throw is not the physical vertical height. It's really a, a time. It's keeping track of how long a ball is in the air before it comes back to your hand. So we call these beats a lot like you would in music. Uh, if you like, you can think of a beat as a thud, because of course, when the ball hits your hand, it makes a little sound. So if you imagine someone juggling in front of you, you close your eyes, you sort of listen for when those thuds are happening. And that's giving you the rhythm and the, the timing for the pattern. So here's a little image. I'm going to click through to the animation so we can see a juggling pattern. And I've got several of these. Hopefully you're all seeing it. Okay, so this is the first of a few animations. And this is just the, the standard pattern that you usually see people do with three balls. And it's called the three pattern. I'll get to that in a second. But if you just follow the beats, you'll notice every time a ball comes down, the next ball will land in the opposite hand. There's that alternation between left and right. And that's every time a ball hits either hand, that's one beat. So you can sort of count through the pattern. So beat, 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 beat. So all the balls are doing the same thing. And if you're insightful here with, if you look closely at the animation, you'll notice that each ball takes three beats to come back down. So as it's being passed from one hand to the other, the other two balls hit in intermediate time, and then the third beat is where the ball returns to their hand. So that's the idea. When we think of, oh, I need to change the share back to the slides. If we think of the, the whole thing rhythmically, and we think of beats as measuring time, then we can do this. 
So this is called the juggling diagram. So I have array, I have an array here, just a row of dots. Those are the beats. I throw a ball, it takes three beats to come back down. So there's an, an arc to represent the path for that ball. And then you do it for the next ball and the next one. And then it repeats because by the time you hit the fourth dot here, the first ball has come back down and you immediately throw it again. Okay, so we have repeated throws of height three, nothing surprising, uh, but having the juggling diagram gives you a mathematical way to visualize how these balls are interacting. So if you think about time flowing infinitely far into the future and into the past, then you would get this infinite string of threes. So every single beat is a throw of height or, um, yeah, height three. And again, the word height here refers to time, not to physical height. But if you're making those throws forever into the past and future, you would have just that infinite sequence of threes. And then, of course, since these are going to be periodic, we usually just shorten it up and say, okay, it's it's the three pattern. Now we'll put a three here in parentheses. Okay, and this is what we mean by a site swap. So for any juggling pattern you want to do, you just give the numerical code that tells the juggler how long each ball needs to be in the air, in what sequence those happen, how long until that pattern repeats. And assuming for the moment that you're alternating between left and right hand, you also have an idea of, of how to get started, right? Which balls begin in which hand and so forth. Okay, so this is a totally new notation. Let's practice it a little bit before we try to do any heavy duty math. So here are two other patterns that jugglers may have heard of. I think the one I hear the most other than the three pattern is the four, four, one. And I'll go to the animation in a second, but take a look at the juggling diagram underneath. So by four, four, one, we mean that the first ball gets thrown for four beats. So we can count through to four. And then the next one also counts for four beats. And then while those two are in the air, you make a quick throw from one hand to the other. That's just a one beat throw, but that sets up the ball to get thrown again immediately on the next beat. And then it goes to a, a height four throw and then it repeats. So four, four, one, continuing on. And then for five, three, one, not surprising. We have a throw of height five, then three, then one. And then when that third ball comes immediately back to your other hand, you can start with a five throw. And the reason I bring these up is because when you look at the animation, you notice something notably different is happening. Okay, so there's the old one. Let's move over. There's your 441 pattern. Uh, what I invite you to do here while you're watching it is pick one ball out of the three and just follow it, see where it's going. See if you can keep track of what throws of height four and one are happening and in what sequence. So one thing you'll notice almost immediately is that there's this U-shaped pattern that the balls are following. So when one of those high throws gets made, it returns to the same hand. So that's the throw of height four. And it sort of makes sense that if we alternate between left and right hand with each beat, that any even numbered throw will have the ball land in the same hand again. So those high throws of height four on either side, left and right. And then the quick throw of height one passes it from one hand to the other. And then the U pattern can be completed that way. So a ball gets thrown high twice in a row with one hand and then quickly tossed to the other hand. So now let's look at the 5-3-1 pattern. Still three balls. Notice the throw of height five means that we have like a little, it's a little more zoomed out so we can see the full path. Now do the same thing, pick one ball and follow it. All right, uh, so what did we notice that's different compared to the last one? It, it looks like each ball is just in its own path. Like they're not 
they don't connect up at all. Is that true? Yeah, in a, in a way that that's the idea here. So there's, depending on which ball you picked, you might've seen a different pattern happening. And that's, that's sort of the same as what you were saying just now. So the ones that get thrown high, focus on one of those for the moment. You'll notice you get this high throw of height five and it's an odd number. So it passes from one hand to the other. And then it's immediately tossed with a height one throw back to the original hand. So those, there's two balls doing that. They're getting tossed high from one hand to the other. Notice there's that third ball that's just sort of getting loosely thrown back and forth. And so you, you've sort of got two different patterns that are being interwoven with each other. And if we go back to the juggling patterns, the diagrams, we can see that just without having to look at an animation or attempt to juggle any of these. So you can see following the pattern for 441 that each ball, you could call this an orbit if you like, each ball has an orbit 441. They're all doing the same thing. They're just a little out of phase. And the timing works so that no balls land at the same time, but otherwise they're all doing the same thing. For five, three, one, it's different. So there's two balls that are doing a five and a one alternatingly. And then there's this third ball, the one starting at the second beat here, that's just doing a three continuously. Okay, so you get the sense that there's a lot of variation even with some very simple site swaps. Okay, so some things we've already been noticing, I just wanna call them out here. So the beats, that we're keeping track of, they always alternate between the left and the right hand. You can think of these site swaps as being periodic. That's called the length. It is operating just like the period would for a sine function, right? It's telling you how long until that cycle repeats again. And for now, we're only interested in what's called monoplex juggling. So uh, people do research what's called multiplex juggling, but for this talk, uh, I'm assuming that at most one ball can be caught or thrown at once. And that means that you can't have two balls land in your hand at the same time, or even land in opposite hands at the same time. So any balls landing simultaneously are called collisions, and we're going to exclude those. So you have some number of balls that you're juggling, you're alternating throws between the left and the right hands, no collisions. And we're considering that to be a sight swap. If we want to be more precise mathematically, then if you think of the beats as happening just generically at times i and j, so if you have two balls thrown at those times, you can call t sub i and t sub j the height of the throws, that's the number of beats there in the air, and in order to avoid a collision, you can't have t i plus i equal to t j plus j, and this gives us our fundamental mathematical definition for a site swap is avoiding that equality. And so, all right, we're ready for the definition. A, a site swap I'll define here as a finite sequence of non-negative integers. So you could have a zero. Uh, if you think about it for a second, a zero means all the balls are in the air and there's nothing for your hands to do. That can happen occasionally, nothing wrong with that. And I'll say a site swap is valid if it has no collisions. So a valid site swap is one where the quantities ti plus i mod n are distinct. So I've introduced some modular arithmetic here, but if n is the length or the period of the pattern, then it's just those first n throws that tell the story. Okay. So now we can start asking some questions. Here's a good one to start with. So if you have a valid site swap, if I just lay one of these numerical codes in front of you, how do you know the number of balls required to juggle it? So the code itself, it doesn't seem to tell you whether it's three balls, four, five, some god awful number that's much bigger. Like you don't necessarily know. Fortunately, there's a theorem, and this one dates back to 1991. So this is Timon and Magnuson. And it's, it's a really satisfying theorem. So if you want to know how many balls are required to juggle a valid site swap, just take the average of the numbers. So just the straight arithmetic mean, and that'll tell you the number of balls required. So for example, 
we did 531. We saw the animation for that. And sure enough, you take the average, you get three. So there's three balls required. If you were to do something more elaborate, like 51635, well, take the average, you get four. And notice if it's longer, if the period is five here now instead of three, you're dividing by five. Um, and if I go back over to the animations, I've got that one queued up also. Maybe I. Hello, welcome, morning, morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, give me one second here. Let's see if I can get the animation I want. There it is. Okay, so we've got four balls. <clears throat> and you can see the that very high throw. That's your six. And then there's two throws of height five mixed in, a throw of height three, a throw of height one. And so you can see it's just sort of a free for all, but you know, our imaginary juggler can keep it all straight. All right. That's the first theoretical result. We have this averaging theorem telling us the number of balls in a valid site swap. Well, let's ask the reverse question. So now let's say we have a certain number of balls. So if we're given B balls and some length of the pattern N, how many valid site swaps are there with that length? So now we're getting into a combinatorial question. Can we count the number of valid site swaps given those two conditions? So if we know B and N. And so some examples here, if you start in this first bullet point with two balls and length two, turns out there's five patterns. And the reason I'm bringing this in is because I, I wanna make some distinctions on how we count these. So two, two, that could just be written as the two pattern. You don't need to write a duplicate two. It seems redundant. But in our counting, we're gonna we're gonna count that as as its own pattern. So it's a length two pattern, even though it's the same as a length one pattern. And then we have four zero zero four three one one three. Okay. If we have b equal three and n equal three, it turns out there's thirty seven patterns. So you get the sense that there's something going on with the numbers. So clearly 900 can be written out in three different ways. Those are cyclic permutations of each other, right? 090009, we're counting those as distinct also. So uh, repetitions of a pattern count on their own, and then also cyclic permutations of the same pattern count on their own. And you know, once you've developed a way to count that way, you could exclude all of those duplicates later if you wanted to. But most of the results count them as distinct. Okay, so I wanna give an idea of, of how we know how many of the patterns there will be. And a really easy way to visualize this is what by using what are called juggling cards. And uh, this idea comes from Burkhard Polster who wrote the book on juggling and it'll be in the references here at the end. But for now, let's fix on B equal to four. And we have five juggling cards. I'm going to label them C zero, card zero, through card four. And so at any moment in time, these codify what can be happening with four balls. And the, you know, C zero doesn't say much, but it does say a little, it says that all four balls are in the air. No balls are landing in either hand. And then of the four horizontal lines, when a ball comes down, you can represent that as one of the four remaining cards. And you know the, the lines, the height, relative vertical height of the lines is really a construct. It doesn't tell us anything about physically where the balls are. It's just telling us how long a ball is in the air and we're just keeping keeping them organized and separated. Okay, so at any moment in time, any one of the four balls could be landing or none of them. So we get naturally five different cards. And the neat thing is you can build any four ball juggling diagram from these cards. And remember those juggling diagrams, that was the arc diagram with all the beats across the bottom that I was using before. Okay, 
So here's some examples. And this is where uh, I'll bring up some annotations so it's a little easier to see. So if we start with this one, I've laid out five juggling cards. So C3, C2, C4, C1, C2. So C2 got used twice, that's totally fine. Um, and I have a length of five. And you can just follow each ball. So if this ball on the first beat gets thrown, let's think of how long it takes for that ball to come back down. So we go one beat, still in the air, two, three, four. And then on the fifth beat, when you cycle back to the beginning is when it lands. So there's a, that's a five. You can go over to the next one, one beat, two beats, three beats before it comes down. And then the next one is just one beat. And then the one after that, we have one, two, three. And then the last one we have, let's see, one, two beats. So you can scan through and identify the height of each throw from the juggling cards. If you go to this next one, you can see that's the three pattern because each ball takes three beats before it comes back down. Or wait, no, it's not. <laughs> not the three pattern. Hang on. One, two, three, four. I think this is our four, four, one. Yeah. Okay. So here are the answers. That first one is five, three, one, nine, two. The nine is sort of surprising. Um, the four, four, one, you can track that the first two have height four for the throw. The last one is just a height one, comes down immediately. And then we're going to throw in a new one. If you have a, the single juggling card C0, all four balls are in the air forever. You don't have to do anything. Um, this is the zero G version. But uh, think of that as just an empty set of parentheses. Okay, so here's a counting theorem. Uh, this comes from Bueller and others from 1994. So if you're given an integer n, there are b plus one to the nth power valid site swaps with at most b balls and having length n. And we're counting those repetitions and cyclic permutations separately. Um, now you can imagine the proof is pretty technical, but I'm gonna give you the, the short, quick description. Think of the juggling cards. If you have B balls, how many juggling cards are there? Well, B plus one. You have one card for each ball that could possibly land in a given moment. And then you have the possibility that none of them land and that gives you one more card. And this is where the proof would need to happen. But each site swap can be represented by set setting N cards in a row with repetitions possible. So the total number of site swaps would be B plus one to the N. Now notice in the statement of the theorem, there's an inequality. So this is site swaps with less than or equal to B balls. So you would get everything from one ball and also zero balls for that matter, all the way up to B. So if you want to get the number for exactly B balls, you can just subtract. So with the corollary here, and this gives us the counting result that we were interested in. Uh, if you have an integer N, and B balls, then you can take B plus one to the N minus B to the N, and that will tell you how many valid site swaps there are. So those examples we did earlier, if B is two and N is two, then we know that we take three to the second minus two to the second power, we get five. Great, that enumerates all five that we saw. And then for B equal three and N equal three, the reason we had 37, is because that is four to the third minus three to the third. All right, so we've got some nice results here. We know that we can average the numbers in a site swap and we can count the number of site swaps of a given with a given B and N. So where I get interested, um, and you know, the combinatorics is interesting. I'm a number theorist. So I always like thinking of things that behave like prime numbers. And as a preliminary to that, if we're thinking of these site swaps, as our this set of numbers, we'd like to be able to multiply them. And this will lead us eventually to the idea of what 
what holds the idea of a prime number here. So we're going to make an analogy here with the primes. If you think in terms of juggling cards, you could try combining patterns by concatenating, just to take the two sets of cards and squish them together, you get a new pattern. Unfortunately, when you do that, that's not compatible with the site swap notation. So what I did here in this example is I took 531, that's over here on the left, and I tried developing a way to multiply with 51. When I write out the site swap for the pattern I get, it's 46131. So like there's no obvious way that to read the site swaps and figure out that, oh yes, it's 46131. The alternative would be to concatenate the site swaps instead of the juggling cards. And we can make it work, but at first it doesn't always work out for us. So if you have 531 and 51 and you want to concatenate the two, you get a length five pattern, 53151, but that's not a valid site swap. And if you check against the definition, you'll see there's going to be a collision when you do that. So we can't concatenate every pair of site swaps. The next natural question, though, is which ones can we concatenate? And so we can restrict to compatible sets of patterns. And I'm going to focus on one type of pattern called a ground state pattern. But there's lots of other, um, their equivalence classes. There's lots of other ways to group them together. So I'll say a ground state pattern, just loosely speaking, is one where you could stop juggling. So just put your hands down and then listen for the balls to come down. And if it's a ground state pattern, then you are going to hear B thuds for each of the next B beats as each of those balls falls to the ground. Like I said, a loose definition here. It's, it's sort of saying that uh, the timing was just so that the, each of the balls fell in each of the next B beats. If you think about it, there might be a pattern where you've thrown a ball really high and then you immediately stop juggling. And sure, maybe all the other balls hit the ground immediately, but that other one takes so long that there's maybe a gap in time before it hits. So we're considering ground state where they all come down immediately. Now, this is the three pattern. That's what you're seeing here at the bottom. So if you follow, um, if I stop juggling at the end of these three, one ball comes down, thud, then the next, then the next, right in a row. So it takes three beats for those three balls to land. Okay, so some nice things that we get if we restrict to these ground state site swaps. They're all compatible with the standard one. So that's just B on its own. So if B is three, then we have that three pattern we started with, four, two, four, two, three, four, four, one, five, three, one, and of course, the length can be as long as you want. So there's an infinite number of these. So some other things to notice. Uh, you can multiply any two of these, and you will get a valid site swap. Um, I'm not going to prove that or anything, but um, if you imagine that they have that ground state situation where all the balls hit one after the other, you can sort of dovetail one pattern off the other and they align. There's no collisions created. When we get into the number theory, uh, it turns out that multiplication isn't always commutative here. So 3, 4, 2 is the same as 4, 2, 3, but if you throw a third one in there, uh, you can mess it up. Like you can take three patterns together and swap two of them. That's not the same juggling pattern. And then most of these site swaps you can factor, which just means you start with some long numerical code and you break it down into other ground state site swaps. And at some point you can't do that anymore. So if you can't factor a site swap, we'll call it primitive. And then the identity here you could think of as being that empty site swap. So this is where I get interested from a research perspective because we have this set a set of site swaps, and specifically ground state site swaps. We have a way to multiply them. We have a way to factor them. And we have this analogous definition for what a prime looks like. So the ones that can't be factored, we're calling primitive, but they behave 
uh, and operate a lot like prime numbers. Okay, so people have been exploring this idea for a little while. Here's a theorem from Chung and Graham. Uh, this was 2008. So if you're given B, you'd like to count the number of ground state juggling patterns with a given length. So now restricting to the ground state only. And so their result is that if you have B and N fixed, then you can count the number of juggling patterns with B balls and length N by using factorials. And we've got this J sub B of N symbol that's counting the number of them. And you'll notice if N is less than or equal to B, it's just N factorial. If N is bigger than B, then you get this slightly different definition. Uh, B factorial, so you multiply up to B, and then you get to B plus one, and then you just hold there. You multiply it together N minus B times. So if you just count the number of factors in each factorial, there's still N of them in either case. So N factorial obviously has N terms. And then this other expression has N terms. So B of them at the beginning and then N minus B of them in the end. So some examples here, if you had a length of zero, that counts now. So zero factorial is one. Well, there is one site swap of length zero, it's the empty one. If B is three and N is three, then uh, that's the first case in the theorem. You would get three factorial, which means there's six different patterns of length three. So there they are. If you go on and take something like B equal four, N equal seven, then you do this modified factorial where you multiply up to five and then you keep multiplying fives together. And so in this case, it gives us 3000 site swaps. Okay, and I want to give you a, a flavor for this theorem as well. So here's here's a very general outline. And uh, I have this paper in the references at the end of the talk too. So if anyone's curious, they can bring this one up. Uh, so Chung and Graham's theorem comes down to counting permutations. So if you have a juggling sequence, I'll call it S, this is a site swap, so T1, T2, up to Tn, just a bunch of non-negative integers. That'll satisfy this condition below. And I'm asking you to read between the lines, maybe, or trust that this is correct. But notice that Ti plus I, that comes from the definition. So that's saying I make a throw of height Ti at time I. And I don't want collisions. And I know the periodicity of this thing, the period is n. So I am going to get n numbers ranging from b plus 1 to b plus n. Now, those are sets. So the order might be all mixed up, but the two sets are the same. So if I just take ti plus i for 1 up to n for those first n beats, I should get n distinct numbers ranging from b plus 1 to b plus n in some order. So essentially then S corresponds to a permutation on N things. You have N things here in the second set. And I could define that permutation by just subtracting B from whatever I get from TI plus I. So if I have the set from B plus one to B plus N, I subtract B from all of them, all right? Now I've got a permutation of the numbers one to N. So if you wanna count juggling sequences, you wanna count them so that the permutation pi of i is equal at defined to be equal to ti plus i minus b, you want that to be greater than or equal to i minus b for all i. Now, taking that inequality is the thing to check. Uh, let me do an example. So if you have n equal to 6 and b equal to 3, then you would have 6 throws in some order. That's your site swap. And then underneath, I've written out what i minus b is. So in blue here, we have negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and we continue up to 3. So by the time we get to the end, um, i minus b, that's just 6 minus 3, so we have a 3 here. And the reason we do that is because we need to count all of the permutations that would give you at least 3 as the sixth number. 
So if you're permuting six things and I tell you, oh, you have to have three or greater in this position, well, then just count them up. Three, four, five, and six are your options. If you're going to put a permutation there. So there's four choices that you can make for that last slot. Move to the left one. Now the threshold is two. So we say, okay, how many numbers could I slot in there? There's two, three, four, five, six. That's five of them, except I picked one already for this position on the right. So it's really just four. And then you repeat that. And eventually this threshold gets far enough down that there's no conflict with the permutation. Like we don't write negative numbers in permutations. We don't write zero in a permutation. So when you get to one, you can do one, two, three, four, five, six. Excluding the two previous choices, you still get four. But then after that, for zero, you now have three choices. Negative one doesn't really restrict anything anymore. You just go down like a factorial. Okay, so the total count then would be one, two, three, four, 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 all multiplied together. And that is three factorial times b plus one cubed, which is coming from that formula in the theorem. Okay, so a lot of juggling patterns, maybe not so surprisingly, reduced to different ways of permuting n things. So that's where a lot of the theorems go when they're trying to establish these results. Okay, so if you remember from the last slide, this was a result from 2008. So we're 15 odd years on from that. More keeps being done every day. It's an expanding, but still very new mathematical research area. Uh, so here's a question I was looking at a few years ago. And this comes back to my training as a number theorist. I'd like to know something about how many primitive ground state site swaps there are with length n. And I'm using p now for primitive. That's our counting function. And it's not surprising. That's a lot harder to answer. So just like with rational primes, counting primitive juggling patterns, that's a really diff difficult question. And with rational primes, the best we can do often is estimating. So this is the estimate. And so this is now almost uh, four years old. But uh, if you have at least four balls, then you can count, or at least asymptotically, you can count the number of primitive ground state juggling patterns with B balls in length n. And it's this asymptotic result. Um, I'm definitely not going to prove it. It gets pretty technical. Um, you start bringing in a lot of analytic techniques. It's no longer just combinatorics. We're sort of bringing combinatorics and number theory together. But uh, if you're looking at P sub B of n, then you can approximate it as a some multiple of a power of rho. So rho here is a number. Uh, it's a constant satisfying certain conditions. So it's bounded by the inequalities at the bottom. So we know how, roughly how big rho is. And then there's a polynomial lurking in the background, S sub B of Z. And I'm looking at the derivative of that polynomial at one over rho. And I take the absolute value and then B plus one minus rho above that. So this is some fraction depending on rho and B. Um, but as B, and n, or n in particular, gets big, you can sort of see that rho to the n is what's really governing the, the growth of that counting function. OK, so as I said, I'm not going to put together a proof, but maybe to get a sense of what the theorem is telling us, let me make an analogy with primes. So one classic question that we ask about primes and has been answered for a while now is if you're given a positive integer, what proportion of the numbers from one to n are prime? Okay, you might know that. Uh, the answer came in 1896, or at least the version I'm thinking of came in 1896. Uh, that, that proportion is approximately one over the natural log of n, which is to say that the primes are sparse in the integers. So if you take all the numbers up to n, you say what fraction of them, what proportion are prime, that fraction goes to zero as n gets large. Okay, 
So our question here is similar. So if we're given B and we're letting N get arbitrarily large, what proportion of our ground state site swaps of length N are primitive? And if you grab that theorem from the previous slide, uh, you can boil things down to some constant depending on B times rho over B plus one to the N power. And notice what I did here, I divided by B plus one to the N. That's the number of site swaps of length up to, uh, length up to N, or excuse me, length N and at least up to B balls. So I'm doing a similar thing here, I'm looking at a proportion now, not just the count. Uh, but we know something about the bounds on this thing. So if I take rho over B plus one, and again, going to those inequalities on the slide before, as long as B is at least four, you can get a, you know, a not great bound, but it's definitely less than one, 0.994. So this fraction to the N is smaller than 0.994 to the N. And fortunately, the limit of that as N goes to infinity, that's zero. So we get the same fact about primes showing up again here for primitive juggling patterns. Now, there's a lot more that could be said and that people are thinking about and working on. But for now, I'll just direct you to some of the references. So uh, Burkhard Polster wrote The Mathematics of Juggling. That is where I'm getting the idea of juggling cards. And it's a great read if you're interested in juggling and you want to get started not just on the mathematics, but also the practice of juggling. It's a good summary. And then the paper I relied on for the theorem, the counting theorem that we're going through, Chung and Graham, that's from the American Mathematical Monthly from 2008. And then the paper where I did my most recent work is the one here at the bottom from 2019. All right, thank you all. Thanks. Uh, that was super duper fantastic. I see we've only got one person online. Hi, Daniel. Uh, that was our speaker last week. I'm going to put this link in the chat for them. Very good. Uh, that was super wonderful. Uh, people who are here in the room, uh, questions, things you want to ask Eric about while we've got them. Um, yeah, go ahead. Just a comment. I like the checkering cross that it is not an obvious idea, but it, uh, it helps. For example, it helps you plan uh, your suffering pattern and it also helps you plan. Um, so, I, the audio isn't quite good enough for me to hear. Maybe if you move. Oh, I'll, I can relate that. Um, oh, that's Albert, my question. Okay. Albert was just saying he loves this juggling cards idea. Like, it's very not obvious, but makes the combinatorics really transparent. Yeah. Yeah, and that is uh, Polster's idea. So he he does similar things like that. But yeah, it's uh, it's definitely the idea that I I bring into the talk specifically. You can imagine doing it without the visual aid would just be a lot more uh, time consuming. So yeah, it's a great tool. Other things people want to ask? Things they want to ask our speaker about? Comments? Anything? I'm just interested how much math you could derive from such a simple movement with like uh, juggling some balls, you could like research papers on such yeah. a tiny thing. That's impressive. I'm just amazed, honestly. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, the thing I really enjoy most about it is uh, I can take a lot of the skills that I worked on in, as a graduate student in analytic number theory. So applying like all the tools of analysis and calculus to, to solving problems about uh, things similar to primes, and I get to actually use those deep results here. So yeah, it's it's what makes it an enjoyable thing to research. And there's definitely more that could be done. I have one extra slide if anyone's curious. Sweet, take it away. Okay, so thinking of like what could be done next. And this seems to be a rich area of research that is at least a little bit unexpected, but uh, improving bounds on these numbers in the theorem, that could help and get a like a tighter estimate on the number of primitive sequences. Uh, some things we have not considered 
like what happens if B changes? So mo for these theorems, B is fixed. N is thought of as going to infinity. So like, what if you add a ball? So someone's juggling and you throw a ball at them and they come up with some new pattern to incorporate it. What, what do you do there? Can you analyze that very easily? Or for that matter, if you drop a ball, um, you could think of site swaps being relatively prime to each other. There's another number theory question that seems challenging, but maybe not too hard. And then uh, if you're interested in prime site swaps, definitely check out the Chung and Graham paper. Uh, they, they do some graph theory, develop a, a theory of what are called juggling states, which is lurking underneath a lot of this talk. Uh, you can define something that's sort of like a primitive site swap, but it's it's different in an interesting way. And those are called prime site swaps. So like, could we do the same thing there? But what I like about it is it's still pretty new as a research area. There's a ton that just hasn't been done yet. So I, I think maybe I'll leave it there, though. Thank you all. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we have one more speaker this semester uh, coming up next week. Oh, who's speaking next week? Uh, oh, oh got to go up. Oh, wait, it's just a goose. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so we've got one more talk uh, into the infinite dimensional, an introduction to functional analysis for people who are in A22. This is probably very interesting. Um, so yeah, Justin will be speaking next week. Uh, and I look forward to it. Thanks, Eric, for coming out. It was a pleasure to meet you. Happy to juggle. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.